Good afternoon. Welcome to the Connecticut edition of our state webinar series, exploring the findings from American Farmland Trust's recently released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States report. Before we get started, let me run through some quick logistics. Everyone has been muted, so no need to do that yourself. Um, if you, uh, the, uh, sorry, if you would like to ask a question or to make a comment, you can do so by going to the control panel on the right-hand side of the screen. The orange arrow at the top of that panel allows the panel to shrink and reopen. You'll see a question section of that control panel. You can pop that section out by clicking on the little square on the right-hand side. That decouples it from the control panel, allowing you to type your question or comment in there. And we have set aside plenty of time for Q&A. We are recording this webinar and we'll send the link of the recording to everyone who is registered. Please feel free to share this recording with others. So let me now introduce myself. I'm Chris Coffin, American Farmland Trust Senior Policy Advisor. I also direct our newly launched National Agricultural Land Network, which I'll talk about at the end of the webinar. Co-hosting with me is Chelsea Gazillo. Chelsea manages AFT's work in Connecticut and directs the Working Lands Alliance, a coalition dedicated to protecting the state's farmland and creating a prosperous agricultural sector for all of Connecticut's residents. Joining us as well is Jamie Pottern, AFT's New England Program Manager. And for those of you not familiar with AFT, although I suspect that most of you are, let me do a very quick introduction. We're a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. We believe that saving the land that sustains us means focusing not just on retaining and protecting the agricultural land base, but on the management of that land as well, and on the farmers, ranchers, and landowners who work the land. We work from kitchen tables to the halls of Congress, from direct land protection to soil health and water quality initiatives to training service providers to help a new generation of farmers and ranchers gain access to land. Our programming and research inform our state and federal policy development and advocacy. We have six regional offices and a national office located in Washington, DC. And so with that, let me turn it over to you, Chelsea. Thank you, Chris. Hi everyone, thank you all for taking time out of your Monday to join us for this important webinar. We are delighted to be joined today by a number of valued partners, including many members of the Working Lands Alliance Steering Committee, members and staff of the Connecticut General Assembly, Connecticut's Department of Agriculture and the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, several municipal officials, various USDA staff representing both FSA and NRCS, the University of Connecticut, Connecticut Farm Bureau Association, and several land trusts, including Connecticut Farmland Trust and the Northwestern Land Conservation Trust. We'd like to recognize and thank the Natural Resources Conservation Service, especially for their collaboration and support of this project. They've been an integral partner, as has our research partner in this project, Conservation Science Partners. We'd also like to recognize and thank Chet Arnold, who directs UConn Center for Land Use Education, Education and Research, and Kip Kolzinska, co-chair of Working Lands Alliance and former Connecticut State, Con State Soil Scientist. Chet was a formal member of the project's advisory committee and Kip was an informal advisor. Both provided invaluable insights. And now I want to welcome a very special guest, Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Agriculture, Brian Hurlburt. Commissioner, thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Connecticut has been a leader in farmland protection for decades. And it's nice to see that validated in our Farms Under Threat State of the State report. Yet, as this study shows, farmland continues to be converted. 23,000 acres in the 15 year period between 2001 and 2016, including 11,500 acres of land the report identifies as best suited to intensive crop and food production. More than half of this acreage was converted to low density residential development. 
Given these conversion numbers, I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about what worries you the most about keeping a significant land base to support an industry important to Connecticut's economy. Well, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Chris, and to the team at AFT for this incredible work and document. Uh, I know a lot of energy and effort went into this. Um, and it's very clear by the, um, the amazing amount of information here. I, I have had a chance to take a look at it and um, I appreciate the, uh, the, the compliments, Chelsea, to Connecticut's efforts, um, not only during um, the Lamont administration, but obviously Connecticut has a longstanding um, recognized awareness that uh, farmland is important and we need to be at the forefront of it. Uh, protecting it. Um, and this is actually um, a little history about me. This is one of the reasons why I'm actually in uh, agricultural policy. Um, when I ran for state representative in 2006, um, as I knocked the doors across the 53rd district to towns of Ashford, Colland, and Willington, um, I came across more and more cul-de-sacs and, and developments that weren't there when I was a kid growing up in Tolland. Um, and so, uh, as, as we know, all politics is local. Um, it made me focus on what am I going to do if I get elected to support protecting the character of these communities that were um, agricultural and rural um, for much of Connecticut's history. Um, and that's what launched me into ag policy and moving forward with um, trying to find ways to support Connecticut's farmers to make sure that they have an, an opportunity to be successful, that people know that they exist, where to find them. And over the past um, 15 years, that path has taken me down um, to where I am today. And so I appreciate um, this work tremendously um, because it validates what we've been able to do, but also highlights that we still have more work to be done. Um, and so you asked me what worries me the most. Um, you know, one, having a real market opportunity making sure that Connecticut residents and, and other residents know um, that Connecticut Grown is, uh, is a viable marketplace opportunity that people know they can look for Connecticut Grown products, that when they support a Connecticut farmer by purchasing Connecticut Grown, whether it be fruits and vegetables or other ag products, that they're really contributing to their state's economy. Um, and we're trying to highlight that through the uh, upcoming Connecticut Grown marketing campaign that we're launching. And I think that will drive more people and more interest into Connecticut's agriculture, uh, our industry, which will then allow for uh, a better competition for farmers um, against developers or against families that have had their land in agriculture or in a farm for multiple generations that previously could not have found uh, a person interested in continuing that tradition. Um, so that's one of the ways that I think we can um, help drive uh, and continue to support the industry. Um, and I, I really appreciate that you acknowledge that this is an industry that's important to Connecticut's economy. It's over $4 billion to Connecticut's economy, um, representing over 5,500 farms, 400,000 acres. Um, this is part of Connecticut's economy. It's part of Connecticut's heritage, and it will continue to be um, an important part of, uh, of Connecticut's economy moving forward. And just the last point I'd like to make uh, on this, as we've seen during this entire COVID pandemic, um, a, a lot of significant challenges um, in, in everybody's day-to-day -day lives, a lot of disruptions, um, a lot of new issues that um, people are having to overcome, um, let alone from, from health issues. But what has been remarkable and what I've heard from Connecticut's farmers um, as I've done calls like these or town halls, um, obviously not out and about nearly as much as we used to be, um, is that Connecticut consumers are recognizing what's very important to them in their lives. And Connecticut's farmers are, are getting on that list. And there is a tremendous demand for the direct consumer market and people that have not gone to farmers markets or farm stands or looked for Connecticut grown are doing that now. Um, and so I think it's going to be tremendously important from the department standpoint that we support the opportunity for those farms to stay in business to continue to meet that demand and keep this on 
uh, on everybody's radar that uh, we have farms here that do a great job that we're proud of that everybody should find uh, ways to support um, and that to me is is the 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 silver lining of the COVID pandemic um, I wish we could have learned it in a different way but the fact that we uh, have the opportunity to learn it is still important thank you for that commissioner um, do you think the state has the right tools or enough tools to address the challenges you spoke about? And if not, what more do you think is needed? I, I like to classify our, our, our sets of tools kind of in three areas. We have policy tools, um, we have funding tools, and then we have soft tools. Um, and so from our policy tools, we have some great programs, right? We've got um, a, a great farmland preservation program that's been well-funded, um, that has been recognized by members of the legislature and governors going back for decades to be an important tool um, to make sure that um, we have a policy recommendation behind the work that we're doing. We have great funding tools um, with the amount of funds that are generated through the Community Investment Act, the amount of funds that are made available to us through uh, USDA NRCS, by our partners um, in municipalities across the state who are willing to contribute um, to our farmland preservation efforts. And then we have soft tools. We have the tools um, that allow us in, to amplify this work through our partnerships. And I think of our partnerships with um, the Connecticut Farm Bureau and Working Lands Alliance and American Farmland Trust and Connecticut Farmland Trust um, as ways for us to highlight the value of the work we do. Um, could we use more money? I would never say no to more money, um, but we have limitations on that. On our policy tools, I think we've got a very strong um, uh, farmland preservation program. We're working out some kinks in the process that's um, slowed down um, the ability to move quickly on farmland preservation, but I think that is getting better. Um, we have the, the fantastic 490 program that allows for communities um, to uh, contribute to pr protecting farmland. I think we need to strengthen um, our, our partners at the local level with our assessors and make sure that they all understand why this is important and how they can be um, uh, more effective in helping this process. Not every assessor takes the same approach to, um, to agriculture across the state, which creates um, disparities and the ability for the 490 tool to be effective. Um, we're also using some other policy tools to, to shift. We're redoing our farmland preservation regulations um, to more accurately reflect what's needed in, uh, in, the, um, in the industry right now. Um, we're looking at reducing parcel sizes so that we're not doing these large blocks of multiple hundreds of acres to um, to preserve. But if we have that same set of say 200 acres that a farmer owner wants to protect in perpetuity, instead of doing it as one block, maybe we do it in four 50 um, acre blocks so that it's a little bit more available and accessible to um, the next generation of farmers. Um, those are some of the things that we're working on. Of course, we wanna keep an open door here at the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. There's a lot of experts on this call and this webinar, a lot of experts within our, our partners uh, across the state um, and with AFT um, giving us the national perspective to make sure um, that if there are other ideas out there that we should consider or that we could um, put in place that we, that we take a look at them and I ask for your assistance in, in um, getting those over to the department. Great, great. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, we are going to move into the findings, but I gather that you will be with us for the whole hour, so we will bring you back um, during the uh, question section for your additional perspectives. Um, so let's now turn to the findings from the Farms Under Threat report. Today, we're focusing on the state of the states, which is the second in this research series. It paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state and documents the steps every state has taken to protect their agricultural land base from development. 
We used a multi-pronged approach that included advanced spatial mapping to identify the threats to agricultural land and an in-depth analysis of state policy responses. We're using this report to raise public awareness, to inform state and federal policy, and to encourage more direct and permanent agricultural land protection. And for those of you who did not join us for our launch webinars in May, let me touch really quickly on our national findings, which you see here. We looked, this report looked at a period from 2001 to 2016. So a period of historically low housing starts with a deep recession in the midst of it. Nonetheless, the US converted in this 15 year period, 11 million acres of agricultural land. That's equivalent to all the land planted in the US to fruits, nuts, and vegetables in 2017. The majority of that conversion was to low density residential land use. We've known this type of conversion was happening because all across the country, scattered large lot housing has been fragmenting and disrupting farming and ranching for years. But until this report, no one has ever been able to map it and measure it. And once we mapped it, we recognized just how big of a threat it is. Importantly, more than 4.4 million acres of the land converted was what we have identified as nationally significant land. We'll talk more about that later, but it's land that is best suited for intensive food and crop production. And as you can see from this next slide, Connecticut sadly lands seventh in the report's list of the top 12 most threatened states. These are either on the list because of either total land converted or percent of land converted. While the state also ties for sixth in the report's overall policy scorecard, it's clear that its existing suite of policies is not doing enough to stem farmland conversion. So in addition to the National Farms Under Threat State of the States report, we were lucky to receive funding to produce a regional Farms Under Threat report that weaves together some of the national findings with some specific New England findings. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Jamie Pottern to discuss that report briefly. And hi folks, and, and thanks Chris for that introduction. Um, as Chris said, I'm the New England Program Manager with AFT. And this past winter, my AFT colleague, Laura Barley, and I uh, co-authored this regional report entitled Farms Under Threat, A New England Perspective. The report dives a little deeper into the New England region as a whole, and also draws on a variety of other reports and data sets like the USDA Ag Census and a New England Food Vision. It also draws on our ongoing work funded by Farm Credit East and CoBank. The report goes beyond the farmland itself and also examines threats and opportunities for New England's farm viability and its farmers. It centers on issues of justice, equity, and climate change, and provides recommendations for how we might achieve greater regional resilience for the future. We encourage you to download and read the report, which you can find on our Farmland Information Center. We've also got the link right there on the slide. And just wanted to note, um, I'm also available to present on those findings uh, to your community. Um, we also are happy to mail you a copy if you want to um, let us know there in, in the questions box. Um, so again, feel free to reach out and thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. So now we're going to dive into the Connecticut data on our interactive website that was built for this report. Um, and we're going to be ably assisted today with Beth Frazier, our AFT colleague and ACE um, website navigator. So we're going to start here on the reports and data tab over here on the right hand side. Here's where you'll find the full report you'll find the full score sheet, and you'll find a bunch of other um, fact sheets that describe the methodologies we used for this report. If you are interested in receiving the data layers that went into this report, you can go to this geospatial data layers tab that Beth has um, highlighted right there, and uh, it will take you to a form that you can fill out, and we will be back in touch to let you know which data layers will be available when. So now we're going to go to the drop down menu and um, click on Connecticut. And this takes you to both the spatial data and the policy scorecard. And we're going to start on the spatial data. And first, we're going to point out this um, two page conversion summary that Beth is showing on the lower left hand side. This is a what we think is a pretty nifty two page PDF 
that is easy to download, um, even for those with connectivity challenges. Um, it's got a great number of infographics. As you can see, it has some of the most important tidbits of information on the spatial side. We hope that this will be useful. You can link to it through your organization's website. You can use it to talk to state policymakers, to community officials. We hope you will find a number of different uses for it. And there is also a policy summary that you can download as well. So we bring those to your attention um, in hopes that they will serve a useful purpose for you. And now we're gonna go through the four spatial data layers. We're gonna start with land cover and use. Um, this report used multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory of agricultural land use in the US. You can zoom in on this data layer to identify every type of land use in the state, including land that we've identified as low density residential development. That is the um, orange, the lighter orange, not the burnt orange, which is urban. It also includes a first ever attempt to spatially identify woodland associated with a farm. Our mapping shows 347,100 acres of agricultural land in Connecticut, including 113,200 acres of cropland, 63,000 acres of pasture land, and 121,000 acres of woodland associated with farms. So now we're gonna to move to PDR values. In this report, we wanted to analyze the quality of land that is being converted, not just the quantity. So we created, with the help of a national panel of experts, an index to quantify the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of every acre of land in the US. This map shows the range of these PVR values across the state. As you can see, the darker the green, the higher the PVR value, and the higher the PVR value, the higher the suitability for long-term intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and staple grains. We then use these PVR values to identify nationally significant land. And this next map shows the nationally significant agricultural land in Connecticut. There's 180,600 acres that fall into this category, which represents about 52% of the state's total ag land base. A little more than a half of this is cropland, about 97,000 acres, with 56,600 acres in woodland and 27,200 acres in pasture. And lastly, let's look at conversion. So again, this was a 15 year period from 2001 to 2016. We mapped the conversion of agricultural land to two types of land use. The first is the conversion we're used to seeing and mapping. So urban and high density residential, commercial and industrial development, typically around the edges of cities and towns. This category though also includes rural industrial and energy production sites, including oil and gas well pads, and larger scale solar installations. The second type is low density residential development or LDR. LDR areas range from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual houses are being built. The majority of Connecticut's conversion over this time period, 60%, was to this low density residential development. And let me talk a minute about what LDR is and isn't. It's important to note that this data layer is modeled. It's also important to note that there, well, there may well be active agriculture on some land designated as LDR. And some of this smaller parcel active agriculture may be highly productive and profitable. But we also know that LDR tends to be a transitional land use. Land in Connecticut that was considered LDR in 2001 was five times more likely to be converted to urban and highly developed land by 2016 than other agricultural land. So while we think that having small parcel farms can be very profitable, can provide opportunities, that is very true, but we also know that the trend once land 
becomes low density residential development is that it is more likely to then become fully developed. We also know that continued conversion to low density residential creates management challenges for producers who have to adjust to farming in and around non-farming neighbors. Total ag land converted over this 15 year period was 23,000 acres. This represents over 6% of its agricultural land base. Land converted consisted of 5,600 acres of cropland, 6,900 acres of pasture, and 10,500 acres of woodland associated with farms. And as Chelsea mentioned earlier, half of the land converted was land we considered nationally significant. The loss of this especially productive land is concerning to us for several reasons. First, from an ag viability perspective, as producers are for forced to more marginal land, input costs tend to go up, crop yields tend to go down. And from an environmental perspective, the loss of this more productive land creates more pressure to convert woodlands, pastures, buffer strips to cropland. So reducing conversion to development is critical to making progress on water quality and wildlife habitat goals. And so with that, I'm gonna stop and turn it over to Chelsea for some quick perspectives and a little bit of zoom on the spatial findings. Thank you, Chris. Before I move on, I just wanna make a correction to uh, where I previously acknowledged partners. We Antonog Heritage Land Trust recently changed its name to Northwest Connecticut Land Conservancy. So sorry for the mix up, Paul. Beth, if you would zoom in on the upper part of the Connecticut River Valley, maybe centered on East Windsor. While we see, while we have seen conversion throughout Connecticut, we can see Yeah, that's right. We can see that there is a large concentration here. Beth, if you flip over to the land cover layer, we can see the incredible patchwork of cropland surrounded by high levels of low density residential, as well as urban and highly developed land. What is especially noteworthy about the amount of conversion in this area is the concentration of nationally significant agricultural land in this region. While all farmland is worth protecting, we can see the concentration of our nation's best farmland right here in the upper Connecticut Valley. So when we say to folks that Connecticut has some of the best agricultural land in the country, we're not lying. Beth, can you flip to the nationally significant layer? Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into the whole state at this level of detail on our call today, but I encourage you all to utilize this website and to get to know the most threatened land in your communities. Chris, in the interest of time, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Chelsea. Before we turn to the policy scorecard, um, we're gonna stop and get some input from all of you. We're interested in your perspectives on what you think will drive agricultural land conversion over the next 10 to 20 years in Connecticut. And we do this now before we go to the policy scorecard because um, as we look at what more Connecticut might wanna do, it's important to put that in the context of where that conversion threat is coming from. So that's why we ask this question now. Um, you can um, vote for more than one, and if you're having any trouble voting, you may be in full screen mode and you need to come out of that to vote. So we'll take a moment to uh, give everybody a chance to vote. Okay, Beth, what are we seeing here? Um, all right, so I will say that we have now done more than 30 of these webinars around the country focusing on the state findings. And Connecticut and all of you on the phone are entirely consistent with what folks from other states say almost to a T that these two top vote getters here are the same in virtually, um, every other state with a couple of exceptions. 
and that is more and poorly planned housing, commercial, industrial development, and again, this concern that the generational transfer of agricultural land is a point in time when land is very vulnerable and we need to focus on ensuring that it stays in farmland and in the hands of farmers as it changes generations. So not to say there is a significant score here for weak ag viability and AFT recognizes that um, programs and policies and support for agriculture takes all shapes. And we didn't focus on all of that. And so let's turn to the policy scorecard to talk about what we did focus on. Um, this was our first effort at a state policy scorecard, even though we've worked on federal and state policy since our founding. And we know that there are many ways that states support agriculture, and this is not an attempt to score them all. Connecticut has a great number of programs that range from marketing and promotion and cooperative extension and many other things that support the business of agriculture. What we wanted to focus on was six different types of policies and programs that tie directly to the land. These were policies that there were at least 10 states that had policies in effect. And the ones that we looked at, you can see them on the left-hand side here. So purchase of agricultural conservation easement, PACE programs or PDR programs or farmland preservation programs. Um, Connecticut is one of 28 states with one of these kinds of programs. We looked at land use planning. So most states, including Connecticut, delegate planning authority to local governments but states can play an important and active role in guiding local planning and land use decisions to help stabilize the agricultural land base. And fortunately, Connecticut is doing a pretty good job of that. We looked at property tax relief. So every state in the country has enacted some kind of current use or agricultural use assessment program. So in Connecticut, this is the PA 490 program. We looked at agricultural districts. Connecticut is not a state that has them. There are 14 states with district programs that encourage landowners to form special areas to support agriculture. The protections and incentives offered through these programs differ by state. Some protect landowners in the district with limits on eminent domain and protection from the siting of public facilities and infrastructure. Some offer tax incentives and some link their district enrollment to participation in their state PDR programs. And then we looked at two programs really focused and policies focused on that generational transfer and land access opportunities. So we looked at farm link programs. Connecticut is one of 11 states with state sponsored farm link programs. We know that there are many NGOs out there helping to connect land seekers with landowners who want their land to stay in agriculture. Um, and we salute all of those efforts, but we wanted to call out states that are supporting this type of work, given the importance of uh, this issue and the pending transition of so much farmland between generations. And lastly, we looked at state leasing. So programs that make state-owned land available to farmers and ranchers for agriculture, sometimes that's their primary purpose, but more often, ag use is secondary to protecting wildlife habitat or generating income for a public purpose. So if you look down a little bit, um, if we can scroll down just a bit, you can see how Connecticut scores relative to other states. Overall, it's tied with California for sixth with pretty good marks across the board. And we're now gonna take a moment to go through some of these, uh, some of the scorecard elements. So Beth will show that we're now going to select policy or programs. We're going to start with PACE. And you see here that Connecticut is in the top 10. It gets good marks across the board here. Um, states that scored higher here had a higher number of easements acquired per year, helped in part by having a higher average in funds spent per capita. So for instance, Connecticut's per capita investment in the farmland preservation program since the program's inception is 82 cents. That compares to the New Jersey per capita investment of $3.48. 
Vermont at $4 and Delaware at a whopping $6.02 per capita. Three of the higher scoring states also get points for the use of either an affirmative covenant to farm or an option to purchase at agricultural value. So provisions designed to encourage farm ownership of protected land. Commissioner, it was great to hear you talk about the need for smaller parcels and thinking about how you're configuring land um, through the farmland preservation program, um, because that is what we would conceive, uh, we would consider to be valuable as well. So while we're on pace, I just want to note the importance of the Federal Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, as well as the Regional Conservation Partnership Programs. ASEP and its predecessor FRPP program have brought $68 million in federal matching funds to Connecticut's farmland preservation efforts, so they are an extremely valued partner. We hope that the funding increases in both of these programs, as well as key statutory changes in the 2018 Farm Bill will allow their robust use in Connecticut. And I'll talk about it a little bit more about the National Agricultural Land Network, but through the network, we will continue to work with partners in Connecticut and across the country with NRCS to maximize the utility of these programs for farmland protection. So let's look quickly at land use planning. Connecticut, again, is in the top 10. It gets points for having a state plan for conservation and development and for requiring local comprehensive plans in order to be eligible for state discretion, certain state discretionary funding programs. What it lacks, though, is the teeth that a few other states have. States that scored the top of this category, notably Oregon and Washington, require consistency between the state's planning goals and those local comp plans. They require all local units of government to identify their important ag resources and then to take steps to stabilize those resources. So essentially, they've added a little bit of a stick to the carrots around local planning. On property tax relief, Connecticut's PA 490 program doesn't score quite as well as many other current use programs. It's largely because it doesn't have a statutory minimum active agricultural use criteria. Um, while it does have a graduated withdrawal penalty, those penalties are not rolled back into farmland protection, which some states do. Um, and I let me move on because I'm looking at what time it is. So let me just get through the last couple. Um, on Farm Link, Connecticut gets great marks. It scores its second. It's a close second behind New York. As you can see here, New York edges out Connecticut because it's got a number of, it's got a higher number of land posting and provides a little bit more in terms of tools and resources available. And then lastly, let me talk about state leasing for a minute. We included this category because we feel that state-owned land may offer additional leasing opportunities, especially for young, beginning, first-generation, and Black, Indigenous, and people of color farmers. Connecticut gets very high marks here for the leases provided by the Department of Agriculture and for having given the Farmland Preservation Advisory Board a role in assessing lands that might be suitable for ag. I note that there doesn't seem to have been a full assessment of state-owned land available for ag, so not necessarily all agencies like the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection lands, so that is an area where still some additional work might um, be valuable. And on the uh, as we go out of here, I just want to note that Connecticut does not get credit for some things that we consider to be very valuable. And some of these will certainly be included in a future scorecard. I would point particularly to the farmland restoration program that Connecticut is seen as a leader in the country and many other states have said, wow, what a great idea to be providing that kind of support for farmers who are trying to bring back marginal land. Um, same with the farm, um, transition and the farm viability grants, that those are hugely valuable. We recognize those values, but we weren't able to score everything. And that was a case where they were, there are only a handful of states um, and not really enough to score. 
So I hope that was a helpful cruise through the findings. If you have questions, please write them down. And as we go out of the website, we're gonna launch another poll, which asks which policy or policies you think would be most valuable to focus on for Connecticut. We were not able to add in um, all six here. So if you think that state-owned land or Connecticut Farm Link are the most important, or for that matter, any other type of program you feel is the most important for Connecticut to focus on, please um, write them in in the question panel. And we'll take a second to let people vote. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Land use planning, number one, followed by property tax relief and PACE. That is great to see. I will note that the National Ag Land Network this fall will be hosting a series of webinars. It's gonna take a deep dive into each one of these separate um, policies where we're really gonna look at the top couple of scorers in uh, every category and what makes them so highly efficient and what can the rest of us learn from that. So I hope that people will stay tuned for those webinars and that they will be useful for those who want to dig in further on the policy front. Um, one thing missing from our spatial analysis is protected agricultural land because there's not a comprehensive national data layer focused specifically on farm and ranch land protection. We are building this new database now, um, and we're doing quite well on this throughout New England. If you have not heard from us and you hold agricultural conservation easements, please let us know by adding a comment in the question panel and we will be in touch, but it's great to see all that green already there in Connecticut. So with that, let's pause and Chelsea, um, let's see if there are any questions. Thank you, Chris. Here's a question and I'll take a stab at answering it. What can state and local officials and volunteers do to help address issues of farmland access for black, indigenous, and people of color? So first, we need to acknowledge that indigenous folks were the first cultivators of our working lands in Connecticut, stewarding it long before colonists arrived. Today, there are in fact five state recognized tribes in, this, in Connecticut. The state rec recognition of these five is in no means indicative of the many indigenous groups that were here prior to uh, the colonists arriving. We also must recognize that many members of our community who were brought here against their will and who have been exploited for generations since their arrival. State and local officials and volunteers need to work directly with Black, Indigenous, and farmers of color communities to build relationships and better understand their needs. While we know USDA's Ag Census is not a complete picture, we can use it to see some trends. It shows that while the number of non-white farmers in New England are increasing, most do not own their land and many are new and beginning farmers. The census also tells us that there are over 70 new and beginning non-white farmers in Connecticut managing a little over 500 acres of our working lands. Programs like Yukon Solid Ground Training Program and many municipalities such as New Haven are supporting immigrant, refugee, and farmers of color with access to land. Many of these farmers need more secure land tenure on land in the form of afford affordable ownership or leases. To help accomplish this and other resources, this land and other resources can be gifted to BIPOC farmers um, or given back to indigenous communities. We encourage state and local officials to check out the reparations map put out by Soul Fire Farm for more information. I also encourage you to reach out to some folks of the BIPOC of BIPOC led organizations in the state, such as Love Fed New Haven or CT Corps. Uh, Commissioner, here is a question for you. 
the poll showed that folks on this call are most concerned about poorly planned development and the risk of generational transfer. The question about the most valuable policy answered land use planning. We don't have a huge amount of time, but I was wondering how this reconciles with your thoughts and what more you think we can do on the planning front. How come you got the easy one, Chelsea? <laughs> uh, no, that, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, we have a, a number of, of really good tools. I think, you know, we mentioned the farm link earlier and um, how well that was rated. Um, I think we need to also start uh, empowering our local um, land use commissions to think about climate change and the value um, that agricultural lands um, bring to climate change mitigation and, and runoff. Um, one of the other things that um, we did here in Tolland um, that I think would be important for other um, communities is to um, encourage towns to do a local referendum to dedicate additional dollars available for open space and farmland preservation so that when a parcel comes up, um, they've already identified um, either the parcel or just the fact that they should be preserving land locally um, as an important component. Um, and that goes to one of the bills that we've been um, uh, advocating for uh, at least a decade uh, at the state capitol, which would all put a, a small um, transfer fee um, uh, associated um, with uh, the sale of a property into an, an open space or farmland preservation account. So again, that, that um, by putting some of those policy tools in place, you would bring along the funding tools that would um, give the priority for um, local towns to have a, a stronger commitment to farmland preservation um, and also acknowledge for the, the landowners that they have another tool and that their community thinks that this is uh, an important um, uh, program locally. And, um, you know, we've seen, and, and I'm thinking of a, a project that we'll be announcing shortly, um, a closing that um, the local community did step in with a significant amount of uh, funding to the, uh, to the cost of the project. And I think that does make it a bit easier um, as we um, highlight the, the value of agriculture and the need to have these partners. And that will also, I think, drive change at the, at the uh, land use councils because the town will have made a commitment um, to, to agriculture through these other uh, policies. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Commissioner. I think uh, that did answer the question. Chris, were there any more questions that you wanted us to answer? No, I think um, let's let's go on and we will um, we'll do the rest at the end. So let's get through the last little bits here. Okay, thank you. All right, so next slide, please. Time's not on our side to save our farmland, which is why AFT just announced the bold goal of doubling the amount of permanently protected farmland by 2040 and reducing the rate of farmland conversion by from 2,000 acres a day to 500 acres a day by 2040. We know that to get to this goal, we need to lock arms with the many partners and practitioners on this call and others around the US who are deeply concerned about saving the land that sustains us. So we hope that you will be a part of this movement as well. Next slide, please. Here are some of the ways that AFT will be strengthening its commitment to farmland protection and specifically how they will impact Connecticut. So number one is establishing the national Agland Network. I will skip over this because Chris mentioned it earlier and we'll speak more to it later. Uh, number two is building our capacity to serve New England. We are increasing our staff capacity in the region to focus on farmland protection, policy education, and conservation planning. Number three is protecting more farmland with our partners. We will be hosting two Women for the Land Learning Circles in the state next month. One that will focus on farmland protection for women land managers 
and another that will focus on climate smart agricultural practices for women land managers in the state. We are in the process of updating our planning for agriculture in Connecticut and conservation options for Connecticut farmland publications, both of which will include new policies, programs, and emerging trends that will support agricultural land protection efforts, land access opportunities, and more. We are advocating for stronger state and federal policies, so we are working with various partners to streamline our state's farmland protection program. We push for local and local funding and strong federal funding for various NRCS programs that have been that have often been critical to farmland protection efforts in Connecticut. We are engaged with others and looking at how Connecticut can use our working lands to mitigate, adapt, and become resilient in the face of climate change and supporting the efforts to implement those efforts. Uh, promoting research-based decision-making. We plan to use the findings from Farms Under Threat to guide our activities on the ground, and we are actively building on this research by projecting future threats from development and climate change out to 2040. We are finalizing the findings of a joint two-year research project on solar development policies and practices across New England and incorporating them into our advocacy e efforts across the region. And number six, providing direct financial support to farmers. All right. Um, we are working to help farmers across access and protect farmland and fill gaps in infrastructure on their farms by providing grants through several different grant programs, the Farmer Relief Fund, a specific COVID-19 response that provides direct cash relief to farms that have suffered losses during the global pandemic. And throughout our, and through our New England uh, farmer microgrant program that works with farmers more closely to help them increase farm productivity and land security. So what can Connecticut do? Next slide, please. Connecticut can analyze and map agricultural land trends and conditions. Yukon Clear gives us a really good starting point here. Connecticut can strengthen and adopt a coordinated suite of policies. This includes a variety of different provisions. One of the most important things we can do is ensure that the state's farmland preservation program is fully funded. This also means we must maintain the integrity and full funding levels for the Community Investment Act. As a U.S. Climate Alliance state, Connecticut has shown a willingness to use farmland protection and support the agricultural viability as effective tools to address environmental concerns, but they are also powerful climate mitigation tools and motivators that provide significant opportunities to help farms, farmland, and our communities as a whole. The Governor's Council on Climate Change, or the GC3, Ag and Soils Working Groups, provides a timely opportunity for us to do this. Finally, we must take a critical look at our state's farmland preservation program and streamline any inefficiencies that are slowing it down. Number three, we must support farm viability and access to land. We see farm viability changes as a major threat to farmland conversion as well. Vibrant farms with stable markets are under far less threat to, con to conversion. We must begin to proactively and aggressively work to address issues of farmland access, especially for Black, Indigenous, farmers of color, such as tax credits, land leasing, and direct financial support through grants and interest loans. This includes white-led organizations using our resources and systems knowledge to listen, hear, and raise the voices of Black, Indigenous, and farmers, farmer of color-led organizations. And we and thanks to the CT Department of Ag, last summer AFT helped convene a farmland access working group, which drafted a report that outlines various programmatic recommendations on this front. While this report may not cover every opportunity, it will come out soon, and it's a really good place to start. Planning for plan for agriculture, not just around it. 
both at the state and local level, Connecticut must encourage municipalities to prioritize land for agricultural use. Cities such as Bridgeport, New Haven, and Hartford have started to implement zoning codes that will pr prioritize urban agriculture. Rural townships such as Lebanon have town ag commissions that advise municipal officials on the importance of planning for agriculture. State and municipal officials can also plan for ag in state and town conservation and development plans. And last, save the best, but don't forget the rest. We encourage all states, including Connecticut, to view their higher PVR lands as particularly important and worthy of targeted protection. We acknowledge that all farmland has significant benefits for agriculture, as well as the important co-benefits, but our highest PVR lands are also the most threatened by conversion to both UHD and LDR conversion. Great, thank you, Chelsea. So um, we are now both close to being out of time and at a point where any additional questions are, and there is one, and I'll take a stab at answering. The question is, there are many community gardens in our state. Are they considered or counted as productive land? Do they add up to anything? Many people of color farm in these community gardens. So the answer in terms of this report is that they probably are not um, counted if they are within urban boundaries. Well, I guess let me let me change that. Um, I suspect that they probably do not show up spatially because they are within areas that are largely defined as urban and highly developed. Again, this is if they are in um, the midst of a city center. Um, and if they're on a very small parcel, it might be that they're considered urban and highly developed or low density residential development. Um, are they considered as productive land? Absolutely. Um, and I think that we need to, as Chelsea mentioned, recognize the value of these lands and the need and the hope that municipalities can continue to identify lands. Um, when we've been having these conversations through this working lands um, the land access working group that Chelsea mentioned, one of the things that was discussed was making many of these smaller plots in urban areas and in major cities to put these parcels on Connecticut farm link so that in fact people can find them and to continue to work with city governments to try and identify opportunities to reclaim um, and create additional um, land, both for community gardens on to commercial opportunities for those who want to farm in an urban and peri-urban area. So I hope that answers the question. We do think that it is hugely important, even if they are not necessarily mapped, but that goes back to the, the point that we say about states can do more to map and analyze land use trends. I would I would suggest that maybe in Connecticut, one thing that would be useful would be to try and do more of this mapping, particularly in urban areas of what are the what is available land and what are opportunities. So um, that seems to be the last question that we have at the moment. Um, I do want to close with one last poll, which asks about technical assistance. And I'm asking this because it's in the context of talking about our farmland information and the National Agricultural Land Network. So you can see that these are some of the things that we are talking about providing technical assistance around. We have done a lot of this work over our past anyway, um, but we thought it would be helpful to see where people feel um, more emphasis needs to be on our part. So while people are answering this, let me talk a little bit about the Farmland Information Center. This is a, um, a national clearinghouse that we've done in collaboration with USDA's NRCS for decades. It is a wealth of resources, both for individual landowners, farmers and ranchers, as well as all of us who are in um, this work professionally. 
it has great statistics, it has great information that makes the case for both retaining and protecting agriculture. There's a lot of studies that are done not just by us, but others. There is increasingly amount of resources around farmland access and opportunities and policies um, around that. There's a wealth of information around farm link and the work that is being done, not just by states, but in um, the NGO world as well, and with links to linking programs. Um, so you can call them, you can ask them a question. They are available and willing to answer things, and they do, and it helps to make all of us AFT people look like we know what we're talking about because we are supported by many people behind the scenes who are a wealth of information. Um, so let's go out of this poll um, just so that folks can, um, this is great information around local ag land protection plans, uh, training around land transfer and access. This is very helpful to know and land use planning tools. So these are some of the things that we are talking about through both the FIC and through the National Agricultural Land Network. The network is AFT formalizing a role that it has played, sometimes better, sometimes worse, over our history of providing technical support and resources and peer networking opportunities for, again, folks who are in the land protection and planning communities. And it is our effort with formalizing this network to do more of this type of work around information sharing, to address topical issues, like a perfect one is what the commissioner was talking about, about um, how you deal through farmland protection programs with the size of the parcels that should be protecting um, that, uh, and the future of parcel size. Um, so that's one topic where we are likely to be having more discussions and we will be having conversations with NRCS to, to identify ways where we can further maximize the use of both ASEP and RCPP as um, programs of importance to farm and ranch land protection. So if you've not already signed up to be a member, please do so. Um, if you have any, informa any um, uh, questions about the network, please be in touch with me. That's my email. Here. Um, and with that, I think, Chelsea, I will turn it back to you. And maybe actually before you, let's give one of the last words to the commissioner um, in terms of any last observations or thoughts before we end. Well, I, I know we're running over and I appreciate the opportunity, but just uh, an extreme thanks to, um, to you, Chris, and your team at American Farmland Trust for this work and, and your um, continued partnership. As you mentioned, you've been doing this for a long time and um, having that institutional knowledge available to us at the department is critically important and helpful. And a special thanks to um, everybody who dialed in to listen to this, who, who are taking a, a time out of their day um, to learn more and think about this important issue. So thank you all very, very much. Great. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for sticking with us for the whole hour. Um, Chelsea, I'll turn it back to you for a Final sign us out of here. Thank you, Chris. I don't have anything else to add, but uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And thank you, Commissioner, for um, participating in this webinar and for your um, partnership. We deeply appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>